Hello and welcome back to our study on Daniel 11 verses 40 through 45. In the last study, we found that the King of the North, also known as the Papacy, is going to assert their authority through the enforcement of the Mark of the Beast, which we have identified as laws requiring people to worship on Sunday. As Daniel 11 puts it, this movement will include all the countries, including the Glorious Land, which means that every nation, kindred, tongue, and people on earth will be pressured into embracing this false day of worship. We saw that when it comes to the glorious land, Edom, Moab, and Ammon, that these entities represent God's remnant church and other Christian denominations and religions who believe in a God or the God of the Bible. But what about those that don't believe in the Judeo-Christian God? Why would they be obedient to a Christian power? And as a matter of fact, why would people that don't even believe in God follow a mandate to worship on Sunday? The answer to this question is very simple, and it's alluded to in Daniel 11 verse 42, which says, He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. We've already seen that Egypt represents atheism and secularism. This was based on the original location of the king of the south after the kingdom of Greece was separated into four parts and then finally into two parts. In biblical times, the king of the north and the south were literal physical nations. However, the king of the north eventually made a transition from pagan Rome to papal Rome, or we could say a literal physical kingdom to a spiritual kingdom. Therefore, we should also expect that at the end of time, the king of the south would also be a spiritual kingdom. This reality is clear from Revelation 11, which we already saw from episode one, refers to the rise of atheism that spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. While we have discovered that Egypt represents political atheism and secularism as a system and ideology, more importantly, we need to remember that systems are made up of people and God wants to reach and save people. Now let's take a moment to look at ancient Egypt to understand how this connection of Egypt to atheism was made by the Apostle John, who is the author of the book of Revelation. In Exodus chapter five, we see the Pharaoh, the king of literal Egypt, asking Moses a defiant question in response to God's commands to free the Hebrew slaves. In verse two of this chapter, the Pharaoh says, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? This question has been echoed by every atheist since atheism has existed. In their perspective and attitude, they're asking, who is the Lord? Why should I believe in this God that has not personally shown me physical evidence of his existence? In an atheist's mind, they will not believe anything they can't see, hear, touch, taste, or smell. This was Pharaoh's attitude towards the God of Israel. However, soon enough, there was something that happened to Pharaoh as it related to his acknowledgement of the existence and power of the God of Israel. According to the account in Exodus chapters 5 through 11, Pharaoh would eventually acknowledge the existence of God as a result of 10 plagues that decimated Egypt. And specifically, during the third plague, which was the plague of the frogs, Pharaoh would call from Moses to entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people. Basically, because of the undeniable miracle that Pharaoh was presented with, he was forced to abandon his disbelief in the Judeo-Christian God. And I want you to keep those words in mind undeniable miracles. A similar scenario will take place during the test surrounding the enforcement of the mark of the beast in Revelation 13. In verses 13 and 14 of this chapter, it says that the second beast will do great wonders so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. Essentially, what we see happening is that miracles will be used to deceive people on earth into accepting and legislating the mark of the beast. Revelation 16 also highlights these deceptions and connects it with the frogs from the story of Pharaoh, as it says, And I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, for they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. 
This verse highlights a spiritual war that will take place, which will see miracles used to deceive all of humanity. In describing this eventuality, Ellen White states that Satan will appear in the character of an angel of light. Through the agency of spiritualism, miracles will be wrought, the sick will be healed, and many undeniable wonders will be performed. And as the spirits will profess faith in the Bible and manifest respect for the institutions of the church, their work will be accepted as a manifestation of divine power. This should come as no surprise to any Bible reader. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. And in 2 Thessalonians, we get an even clearer picture of how Satan will work. In verses 9 to 11 of this chapter, it says, Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. The picture that's painted is clear. Satan will transform himself into an angel of light with signs, miracles, and lying wonders to deceive those that refuse to receive a love of the truth. And as a result, God will permit Satan to bring delusion to the rebellious. Satan's final deception is laid out on page 624 of The Great Controversy, which says, as the crowning act in the great drama of deception, Satan himself will personate Christ now the great deceiver will make it appear that Christ has come. In different parts of the earth, Satan will manifest himself among men as a majestic being of dazzling brightness, resembling the description of the Son of God given by John in the Revelation. The glory that surrounds him is unsurpassed by anything that mortal eyes have yet beheld. When this happens, there will not be one atheist left on earth. The evidence appealing to the senses of every human being will be an almost overmastering deception. And just as Daniel 11.42 has stated, the king of the north will stretch forth his hand upon the countries and the land of Egypt shall not escape. The countries represent every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, or we could say the people that believe in other gods. And Egypt, as we have seen, represents atheism. This verse simply means that there are some from these groups who will reject the final warning message that will be given to the world. Those who reject the final message will be deceived through Satan's lying wonders and will also be deceived into worshiping a false representation of God and accepting the mark of a false religious system. It's interesting to note that Daniel 11 verse 42, it mentions a stretching forth of the hands upon the countries to represent the work of the king of the north. And in the book, The Great Controversy, when discussing the rise of spiritualism, it says that Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the Gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. They will reach over the abyss to clasp hands with the Roman power. And under the influence of this threefold union, this country will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling upon the rights of conscience. Once this deception is accomplished, the papacy will then have full control of humanity. Political atheism will be defeated, secularism will be defeated, and it will be given control of the financial resources and the judicial strength. And we will see exactly how that takes place in Daniel 11 verse 43. It's so important that we understand the issues that are at stake so that we can take this opportunity and take this time to reach those who have not yet heard the full, complete picture of the gospel. And this reality will become more clear when we take a look at the truths laid out in Daniel 11, verse 43. Three verses down and three to go.